from a mother and and you can't just under you can't match a mother's heart. My wife told me one time, she says, What you don't understand about children is in a mother's life, you look at your child as someone who is a part of you living outside of your chest. And you're never separate from them. Well, tonight we want to introduce you to someone who uh, is a drug addict or a former drug addict. Well, we want you to hear tonight from someone whose life was completely consumed by drugs. But by the grace of God, here he is tonight. Billy, come talk to us. How you guys doing? Good. Come on. Good. Let's try this again. How you guys doing? Great. My name's Billy P. I'm a recovering drug addict. I'm a recovering alcoholic. I'm a four-time convicted felon. I've spent 16 years of my life owned by the state of Michigan in one form or another. And when people hear where I've been, the first thing that they say is, man, it's horrible. You must have had a rough upbringing. I didn't. I didn't at all. My mom and dad are great people. Today they're, they're two of my closest friends. And I threw that away. My mom and dad, they adopted four of us, all from different families. I was born in Flint. I have no idea who my biological parents are. And to be honest with you, I don't even care who my biological parents are. My mom and dad are Dan and Sharon Pfeiffer. They adopted me at the age of three. They've given me everything that I ever even needed. The majority of the time they gave me everything that I ever wanted. I grew up in what I thought was a normal family and I don't even know what normal is, but if it is normal, then I grew up in that family. My dad went to work every single day. My dad had the ability to go to work every day, come home, have a beer, maybe two, read a book, go to bed, wake up and go back to work. I never had that ability. You know, I started getting high at the age of 12. I would imagine that my biological parents are definitely drug addicts, if they're even still alive. To be honest with you, I don't really care. And I don't know if that sounds nasty. However, I have learned who I am today. That's irrelevant to me. But I know that I picked up my first drink at the age of 12. And I started experimenting with drugs and alcohol at the age of 12. Now, some of you people will be like, oh, that, that's pretty young. And some of you people will be like, oh, you know what? I can relate to that. There is not a family in the United States that doesn't have somebody suffering or affected from the disease of addiction. Nobody. It doesn't care how old you are. It doesn't care your color. It doesn't care your size. It cares nothing. It doesn't care how wealthy you are, how poor you are, what you do for a living. It wants one thing, and it wants one thing only, and that's you. And when it gets you, let me tell you something. It is the hardest thing I have ever done is to get clean and sober. I have been shot. I have been stabbed. I have lived and been in places that people never want to go to. In conditions that aren't even humane. And that surely is not the way that I was raised. Today I'm the most non-religious preacher you're ever going to meet. I had religion drilled into me from kindergarten through eighth grade. And when I left eighth grade, they never taught me about God's grace. They pretty much told me I was going to hell. And let me tell you something. Going to hell, that ain't a comfortable feeling, is it, Waterford? No. No, it's not. And you wonder why people pick something up to change the way that they think and the way that they feel. You want to know why I got high? I got high for three reasons. One, I didn't like the way I felt. Two, I wanted to feel better. And after 20 years more than the other two, number three, I simply didn't want to feel anything. And it worked. It worked every time I went out and bought it. It worked every time I went out and got it. And I had no idea that I was slowly killing myself on the time payment plan. Nor did I ever one time think that I was hurting anybody who cared about me. You want to know why? Because it is a disease. It is incurable. It's fatal. It's powerful. It's cunning. It's baffling. It's patient. I know everything that there is about it. You know why? I was born an addict. 
You say, how do you know you were born an addict? I know I was. I know that I know that I know that I was. Because one is never enough for me. I'm always looking for instant gratification. I always want more. If it makes me feel good, puts a smile on my face, I can't stop. I remember going to the store with my parents when I was younger than my boy. He'd be standing in front of this candy rack, and this candy rack is humongous. And when you're this big, them candy bars, it looks like there's a bazillion of them on that wall. And they say you can have one. Now, when you're that size, and you're looking at a bazillion candy bars on that wall, how do you just choose one? What did I do? Us dope fiends call it this, I shot a move. I knew that they were going to buy me one, so when nobody was looking, I put the other one in my pocket, right? Bingo. One is never enough. At that young of an age, I still couldn't just settle for one. You see, us drug addicts and us alcoholics, we're the most intelligent, resourceful people that God has placed on this planet. We will shoot moves that you people will never come up with. When we want something, we're going to get it. I can assure you of that. The whole time that I was growing up, my mom and my dad, you know, when I left the, the, the private school, they said, okay, you can go to either Powers Catholic Central or you can go to Grand Lake High School. Well, Powers was like a 40-minute bus ride. Let me tell you something. In today's world, the two meanest places, one, the bus, two, the playground. That's coming from an individual that speaks all over the United States, in prisons, in jails, institutions, everywhere. And I still believe the two nastiest places that we have on this planet is the school bus and the playground. We say nasty, cruel, unkind things to one another. And then, we, and then we back it up and we teach our kids such wrong stuff. We teach our kids and we tell them such crap. Crap like this. We tell them to follow their heart. No! Do not follow your heart! Do you understand me? If you follow your heart, you are going to lose. I know this. You have to teach your kids how to, how to lead their heart. Teach them properly. We say stupid junk like sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never hurt me. Once again, bull crap. If names don't hurt you, then why is it every year? I can't tell you how many funerals I have to do for kids because they took their own life. Because names do hurt. They cut deeper than anything you could ever do to me physically, and you can't take it back. I have a problem with me that when I put drugs inside my body, I cannot quit. I thought all I did was hurt myself. I hurt everybody who cared about me. I gave away my mom. I gave away my dad. I gave away my sisters. I gave away my brother. I gave everything away to the disease of addiction. I moved and I lived in places that I thought would be better only to find out that I brought my worst problem with me because his name is Billy P. And every time he showed up, do what you've always done, you're going to get what you've always gotten. And if nothing changes, then nothing changes. In the Genesee County Correctional Facility, I was butt naked in a Bam Bam suit on the fifth floor, crapping, puking, and pissing all over myself. You see, that's called the bends. That's called detoxing. That's called being bold. In my opinion, every heroin addict in the United States needs to detox just like I did. And just like any other dope fiend out there. I don't believe in Suboxone. It was never invented when I kicked it. On November 11, 2004, I finally said I had enough. And before then, I finally made one more move. I left Flint. I said, I'm going to make one more move. People, we call it dope for a reason. Okay, I thought I had all the answers and all the, all the ideas. I say I'm going to make a move and everything's going to be better. Where did I move to? I left Flint. Where did I go? Detroit. Oh, big old! Good for you! That's exactly where I went. I moved to a much larger Flint. I ended up living in a tent in the alleys of Warren Avenue. I ended up eating out of dumpsters. I ended up becoming that person that I never raised my hand to volunteer to become. I am that crackhead. I am that heroin addict. I am that convict, I'm the liar, the whore, and the thief, and everything. I never volunteered for it. 
Nobody told me when I put it in my arm I can't quit. I'm here to tell you, you want to judge a book by its cover? You can judge this book. You can, because you will learn a lot from it. If there's a way to be using drugs and be successful, I would have found it in my 20 years of running with it. November 11, 2004, I said I'm done. People, in six days, now we don't front no clean time, but in six days, I am gonna have 10 years without nothing going through my body. <laughs> 10 years! People say, how do you do it? You know what? I figured out I picked up everything this world had to offer me to fill a void that I had inside of me. And that void was the shape of God. And on November 11, 2004, for the first time in my life, I got down on my knees. Not because the police told me to. I wasn't looking for something on the floor. I got down on my knees because I was broken. I hurt. I was embarrassed of who I had become. I cried out to a God that I didn't even understand, and I simply said, God, help me. You show me something, and I swear to you, man, I'm going to follow you, and I'm not even going to question why. Now, you remember I told you I was recovering from religion? I was waiting for, like, a bird to fly by me, or, or I'm going to hear, whoa, or a light's going to come through the window. None of that stuff happened. But for the first time in 20 years of my life, I had a warmth come through my body from my head to my toe. And it didn't come from a needle. It didn't come from a pill. I didn't buy it at the quarter. I didn't order it at the bar. And it didn't come from a bottle. I knew right there and then that I was done. You know how I still stay clean and sober? I'm a proud member of Narcotics Anonymous. I'm a proud member of Alcoholics Anonymous. And I live exactly the best of my ability to the way that God himself would want me to live. I don't question, I do. If you're suffering, and if you have somebody in your family, quit helping them die. Quit enabling them. Draw that fine line between helping and enabling. You see, it's when I had to experience the pain and the consequences of my choices and my decisions is when I finally said I'm done. When my enablers finally said I'm done enabling him. It's the only kid out of the four that God gave me and my wife that's ever seen drunk or high dad. My other three children have never seen the drunk and high dad. My wife that lived in the tent with me, she's my best friend. I know how to treat her. People change can happen, mm -hmm. but you have to be on board. Getting clean and sober is the hardest thing I've ever done in my life. Staying clean and sober for me today, it's a walk in the park. You want to know why? Because I'm a, I'm a soldier. I'm not a crackhead, convict, liar, thief. Dude, I'm a prince. Woo! Yeah! I'm a child of God. I'm a soldier for the Lord. Come on! You want to call me a Jesus freak? You go right ahead, because that sure beats crackhead, convict, junkie. <laughs> and if this person can make a change and be who I am, it's possible for anybody. You have to learn how to love us from a distance. It's nothing you did. And it's nothing that you can do to fix us. It's a process that we have to go through ourselves. You are supposed to support us. But learn how to love us from a distance. Because I got news for you. If I pick up at any point, I am one drink and one drug away from becoming the person that I never, ever want to see again. Nor ever want to feel like he felt again. I am one drink and one drug away from ruining everything. And the first person that I'm going to go after are the people that care about me. Because I can. I love you.